Hello everyone and welcome to the Global Mapper webinar for the month of August. During today's presentation, which will be about 60 minutes in duration, we will explore the use of scripting Global Mapper and we will demonstrate how a simple text-based file can significantly streamline workflow and promote efficiency in your data management. Among the topics will be creating a script in a text editor, using a workspace file in a script template, support script commands and parameters, combining multiple processes into a single script file, and applying a series of commands to multiple files. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can use the questions tool on the GoToWebinar panel to the right of your screen. Our panelists will try to answer your questions as they are submitted, and if necessary, the presenter will address any outstanding questions at the end of the presentation. We will respond to as many as we can during the session, and will follow up via email on any remaining questions. Remember, for ongoing questions about the features and functions of Global Mapper, you can always email our support team at geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com. Before we begin, we would like to announce some upcoming dates where you can come out and meet some of the Blue Marble staff and learn about more about our products. September is a busy month at Blue Marble. On the 8th, we will be at the Dot Map Conference in Cambridge, Massachusetts. During the week of the 16th, we will be for, at four events, ECIM in Norway, InterGIS Conference in Pennsylvania, Geospatial Conference of the West Laramie, Wyoming, and Eurisa GIS Pro 2013 in Providence, Rhode Island. On October 30th, we will be hosting the 2013 Blue Marble User Conference at the Royal Sinesta Hotel in Houston, Texas. This is a great opportunity to hear about the latest developments at Blue Marble, to learn how others are using Blue Marble products, and to network with other users. For more information on this and more upcoming conferences and training opportunities, please visit the events page on our website. At this time, I would like to introduce David McKittrick, Senior Applications Specialist at Blue Marble. Thank you, Jasmine, and thank you all for taking time out of your day to uh, uh, learn a little bit about scripting in Global Mapper. This program, this uh, presentation, is mostly intended for those of you who are maybe familiar with the application. But if there are those of you who are new to Global Mapper, hopefully you'll get some insight into some of the capabilities uh, of the software, some of the uh, processes that can be applied to automate various steps within the software. Um, as Jasmine mentioned, my name is David McKittrick. I am a Senior Application Specialist here at Blue Marble Geographics. Um, today we are going to go through various scenarios, uh, various workflows that you can automate, that you can streamline using scripting. The recording or the uh, uh, video will be recorded and it will be available on our website. I'm also going to make available the files that we'll be using today as well as this, the actual scripts themselves. You'll see some sample scripts we're going to be using. I will be making those available. If you are watching the recording of this video, you should find an accompanying link to download the data so you can actually play along as you're watching the video. So what are we going to do today? Well, let's go ahead and bring up our agenda. We are going to start with looking at the basic structure of a script. Uh, a script is essentially a, a file that allows you to uh, automate processes, or define processes uh, that you can perform, not always within the context of the application itself or within the interface, but sometimes under the hood. And we'll be doing both of those uh, today during our session. We'll talk about creating a script template from a workspace file. Uh, those of you who have used Global Mapper will be familiar with the workspace uh, format. It's the file format that you save your map configuration. Well, essentially, you can generate a script from that. I'll uh, show you that a little bit later in our session. Uh, many of you will uh, be uh, creating or, or modifying or editing scripts within a text editor. Uh, Global Mapper scripts are essentially text-based, very easy to create, very easy to manipulate, very easy uh, to modify. If you can type, you can create a script uh, using a simple text editing uh, software. Um, we're going to talk about some of the supported script commands. Now, not every feature and function that you uh, perform within the software is available as a script. In other words, there's no scripting alternative for uh, every feature and function within Global Mapper. But a lot of the data processing uh, functions can be scripted, and we're going to uh, address the common ones again through the use of some specific scenarios. 
we're going to look at how we can process uh, or apply multiple processes in a single script file, not just going through one procedure, but stacking multiple procedures and essentially carrying on multiple processes simultaneously. Uh, we'll also carry out a series of commands on multiple files, and this is where the real strength of scripting comes to, comes to play, where you can apply the same parameters, the same uh, configuration to any number of files um, at the same time. Again, it streamlines workflow, it, it makes your, uh, your use of the software much, much more efficient. So, first question, what is a global mapper script? Uh, my definition comes from uh, various angles here. Uh, let's take it as its very basic level, first of all. It is an uh, easy to build file that can significantly streamline your workflow in Global Mapper. Ultimately, that's what a script is. More specifically, it isn't a text file. We're often asked what the format of our scripting language is. Well, it's text. It's a simple text file. Um, and this text file contains uh, one or more commands and their associated parameters. Now, that terminology, commands and parameters, I will show you in more detail a little bit later uh, when we actually look at the actual structure of a script and we look at an example of a script. The command would basically be the, the top level uh, procedure or process that you want to follow and then parameters would define some of the settings or some of the configuration that apply to that command. A script is a way to automate common data processing procedures without manual uh, the need to manually import or process that data. Often I am asked uh, for suggestions on how to process data um, and more often than not the recommendations I give are uh, building a script um, rather than having to manually process multiple files. The script can do that for you manually and hopefully by the end of the day you'll see how that process works. A global mapper script is the best way to perform certain tasks on large quantities of data. As we mentioned before, the, one of the benefits of scripting is its ability to work uh, with such large quantities of data concurrently, so you can process multiple files at the same time using the same parameters. And this final bullet kind of lets you into a little secret, which I'm going to expand on later in the presentation. A script is essentially a workspace file by another name. If you're working in Global Mapper right now, if, you've, if you're a, a current user, chances are you've saved a lot of workspaces. Those workspace files are essentially script files. Uh, we'll show you how you can use a workspace file as a template for creating your own scripts. We'll do that a little bit later in our presentation. So that is what a Global Mapper script is. Let's talk a little bit about the structure of a script. A script file, as I mentioned, is a text file. The suffix on a global mapper script is .gms, global mapper script. That's how global mapper knows it is a script file. You can create a script file in any text editor with a .txt suffix. The file can be a text file, but you can then either manually change that after you save the file to a .gms file, or you can simply export it and define the suffix during the export from whatever text editor you're using. Either way will work, but ultimately it's a text file with a proprietary and unique suffix. All uh, script files begin with the header that you see on the screen, Global Mapper Script Version 1.0. Um, that's what tells Global Mapper that this is a script and you know, the commands and parameters that follow um, you know, will, will be uh, applied this line is required at the start. And you'll see this in an example. I'll bring up a hypothetical script in just a minute so we can see what this looks like. A script, the structure of a script is defined by either one or more commands. Now commands might be things like import or export or generate contours or generate a watershed or any of those uh, fairly routine processes. Within each command, or associated with each command, are, again, one or more parameters. And those parameters uh, essentially define the uh, nature of the command, or how the command is going to be applied, almost like configuration or settings. And you will see a lot of correlation when we look at some of these commands and parameters to dialog boxes you may be familiar with in the software, where you go through a procedure and you check boxes on or check boxes off. Many of these parameters would mirror that type of functionality. Each parameter is going to be followed by an equal sign and then the appropriate value. Sometimes that appropriate value is simply yes or no. You'll see some examples of that uh, in, in my scenarios. 
Um, there are some occasions when it's a the parameter does not have an equal sign, but most of the time the parameter is followed by a a, a value. And again, this will come into context when we look at the uh, the examples. Structurally, the commands are on their own lines, and the associated parameters and the, the values are separated by a space. And you'll see that in just a second as well. You can put comments in a script file. Um, a line that starts with a forward slash, such as you see on the screen, can be followed by maybe some instructions or a description of what's going to follow. Uh, this is particularly useful if your intention is to uh, perhaps provide a script to some of your colleagues and you want to explain exactly what those steps are. So it's a good learning tool. It also is a good reminder to yourself as to what the uh, components of a script are intended to do. So you do have the flexibility of putting those additional comments. Uh, those lines starts with, start with a, a forward slash. So let's take a look at a script. And the example that I'm going to show you, well, I bring up the right folder, is a very, very hypothetical script. In fact, it's not a real script at all. Um, it's just a file that's intended to show you that structure. You will notice, by the way, in this folder, I have a series of files with a .gms suffix. These are all scripts. Um, these files are ASCII text, so I do have the option, when I right-click, to open them with whatever text editor that I've, I've chosen. In my case, I've got Notepad installed, so I'm going to open these in Notepad. You will also notice that these files are by default associated with Global Mapper, in my case, because I made that choice. When you generate your first script file and you save it as a .gms, Windows will not know what to do with it. If you try to run that script, Windows will say, well, what uh, application do you want me to use to open this file? And at that stage, you, you would choose Global Mapper. Um, you would also establish that as the default. That means that any script can be run automatically and you'll see how this works a little bit later. So that initial file association is something you will want to do when you're working with your scripts. You'll also want to have the flexibility to open a notepad obviously for editing or manipulation. So that's why I have selected open with and I'm going to choose notepad. Now this is a very hypothetical script. Uh, obviously the intention of the script is not to actually perform any function but to show you this structure. Uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the first line of my script says global mapper script. You'll notice the space, then version equals 1.0. And that has been the same for many, many years. We don't have a version 2, version 3. This is just the standard header for the script. All scripts begin with that line. Thereafter, you can apply whatever commands and whatever parameters are appropriate. Now, we will be using some actual scripts in a minute, but for the time being, I merely put in command, parameter equals value, parameter equals value, etc., to show you that structure. So in this case, I've got my command. This might be, for instance, import. The parameter might be what file you're importing. The second parameter might be what type of data it is. The third parameter might be applying some configuration to that data as it's imported. So this is how this structure works. After that import process is, uh, is finished, we may have a second command. And again, the parameters and values. We may want to process that data in some way. We may want to, for instance, generate contours from an elevation layer. Again, a second command and a second set of parameters and values. In my hypothetical example, I've now inserted a line of text allowing me to explain to whoever uses this script what the next line is going to do. And remembering to put that forward slash, this line of text will not be applied in the script. The global Mapper will ignore it, or the Global Mapper scripting engine will ignore it. And then my final parameter, uh, command and parameter, may be an export. You know, export and then the, the file name may be what, uh, what will be written in here. So this is just an overview, a high-level overview of what a script will look like from a structural point of view. Obviously, when we look at some more specific examples, this will become much more meaningful. Now, the, one of the important things to note about a script is it is pretty rigid in terms of the syntax and spelling that's applied. If you're looking for a particular file to import or you're pointing to a directory, uh, any misspelling is going to cause the script to fail. Um, so you need to be quite careful with that. And, and it can be quite frustrating, especially for folks who are new to scripting or trying to build a script, and they try to run it and it simply doesn't work. Well, uh, go back and check the details. Um, my suggestion when you're starting with scripting is to begin with some very basic scripts and then add on to those. 
and you will start to learn uh, what works and what doesn't and with each successive step you can see if that's the point at which it fails you'll know to address that but it is important to, to, to be precise in terms of how this, the script is structured and in terms of the spelling and syntax that, that are included in there. Speaking of syntax, there is an excellent online reference uh, for those of you who want to do a little bit more with scripting, I've just brought up the Blue Marble Geographics website. Right underneath our support menu, I'm just um, we have a knowledge base. And one of the elements in that knowledge base is our Global Mapper Script Language Reference. It's like um, it's a home page, you can scroll all the way down. These are all hyperlinked, by the way, so if you need to jump around on the page, you can do that as well. But what you're seeing on my screen right now are the list of commands that can be applied. Um, generate contours, import, a very common one. Um, play sound, that's an interesting one where you can have the uh, the uh, script actually ch trigger a sound file. Usually that will be applied if you want a, uh, an audible cue where a script has actually completed. So various command options and for each of these for instance I'm going to choose export uh, my raster layer. If I click on the go to that section the list of parameters. This is my command these are my parameters. So for exporting we can look at uh, what uh, settings can be applied during the export process. I would suggest when you're building scripts keep this uh, list handy, keep this up, uh, this website up because it is a very very good uh, visual reference. So let's take a look at some actual scripts. I'm going to close this window and we are going to be looking um, at uh, the scripts in Notepad although they're all as you see .gms files they're associated with Global Mapper. I'm going to preview them um, each of them in, uh, in in Notepad. So my, my first script is a very basic script, again with our standard script heading, but all I'm doing in this case is running an import. There's my command. This is my parameter. My parameter is file name, and there's my equal sign, and all I've done is define the path to the file that I require. In this case it's a JP2, which is a JPEG 2000 file, that's all that it's going to do. It's just going to import that file. You will notice that the path to that file has got quote marks. Uh, the reason for that is because you may find in certain situations that that directory path actually contains some spaces. For instance, my documents or something of that type, where there are actually spaces uh, in either the folder names or whatever other components of that path. With this included in there, Global Mapper will think that it's ready for the next parameter. We would assume it would not recognize what comes afterwards, so it would not work. Um, by putting this inside quotes, it considers this entire string as one entity, so it, the, the import process will work. Um, in this case, I didn't need to do that because, as you can see, there are no spaces, but it's just a good habit to get into when you're uh, defining a file name, and you'll see that recurring throughout various scripts that I'm going to show you today. So this script is intended, as I said, to simply import a file. We're going to begin the process of scripting by actually looking at the running of a script from within the software itself. I have to say that this particular example is probably not that useful, but again, I do suggest starting with baby steps, starting with some very simple scripts just to see how they work and to understand the syntax. To run a script within the application, you go to the File menu and you choose Run Script. I'm going to choose the script file I just previewed, which is a single file import. I'm going to click Open. Now, as a result of that process, you can see the, the uh, language from the script, the actual text itself, is now included in here. Um, and I simply run the script. And as if, if everything goes according to plan, as you can see behind the window, I've imported that one tile. I can run additional scripts if necessary based on my imported data. I can apply certain uh, filters or, or cropping or, or apply certain settings. But at its very basic level, my script simply allowed me to import that file. Now, as I said, that's not that useful. I certainly wouldn't suggest you use a script to import a single file like that. But it's a first step. Let's take a look at importing multiple files. Again, I'm going to open my GMS file in Notepad, and exactly the same structure as previous, with my heading, my command, and my parameter. But in this case, I've repeated the same command, and basically the same parameter, except pointing to a different file. In fact, pointing to four files. I have to say that 
importing multiple files like this can be done in a much more efficient way. I'm going to show you that one next. But you can use a script to import multiple files of different types if necessary. My files are just JPEG 2000s, can be multiple files uh, of different types from different locations. So script, again very quickly from my run script command, import multi, open, and just all four tiles imported. And you can see them listed here in my overlay control center. So importing is a key element of, of scripting, the ability to point to data and to bring it in. Now we're bringing it in in the context of the application, so we're actually see, as you'll see a little bit later, the import process can be used simply to point to a file, uh, apply a process, and then generate some additional files if necessary. We'll get into some of those uh, particular scenarios a little bit later. Now as I mentioned, the idea of using multiple commands to import multiple files in a specific folder, and all of those tiles were in the same folder, is really not that efficient. The next example I'm going to show you, I can open with Notepad, rather than simply pointing to a file, the command in this case is import a directory tree. As you can see, it's not pointing to a specific file, but rather in, uh, pointing to uh, the imagery tiles folder that I have created and saved in, in, on my C drive. All files that reside in that folder will be imported when I run this script. Now, what's important in this case is all of the files or all of the entire contents of that file, of that folder will be imported. I have four files. They're all JPEG 2000s. There is no additional data or additional files in there. So this works in this case. As you'll see with the, some of the uh, scripts we use, we're going to be using in a few minutes, you may also have to define what types of files or some sort of uh, screening or filtering process to import files of a particular type. And we'll see how that works in just a little bit. But for the time being, this procedure will work. All of the data in this folder will be imported. We'll ripped, directory import, and click open. As you would expect, aim end result. Instead of pointing to four individual files, I pointed to the directory and Global Mapper imported them all. So same end result. Now so far our scenarios have all been based on simply importing, just a few different methods for importing, which is the basis for most script work that you're going to be doing. With the next example I'm going to show you, we're actually going to add another command, or actually it's another parameter to our import command. And as you'll see, while I open a notepad, we have added a new line. Again, remembering that we have a space here between parameters. My command, my first parameter, my parameter in this case points to the directory. We have another space, and our parameter is color intensity. Um, don't worry, by the way, about trying to memorize all of these parameters. It, it is like learning a language. Uh, if you're comfortable and familiar with using the application, within the interface, many of these will be fairly intuitive and you can go to the scripting reference guide and you can find how the syntax is applied. If you're completely new, spend time just going through the uh, the various uh, parameters that are available for each command and use the online reference as your dictionary. You can copy and paste from that to build your script file. So in this case I have a parameter called color intensity which is intended to adjust the contrast uh, it ranges between uh, 0 and, and 20. 10 would be no contrast adjustment. Uh, 0 would be all black. 20, 20 would be all white. So I've got a color intensity of about 5, which should apply uh, you know, a heightened contra contrast, which would be a darker image, basically. Uh, actually, no, I'm not sure. It wasn't contrast in this case. This is actually color intensity. But this adjustment can be made, again, during the import process. Pointing to the same file, I'm applying this color intensity value. Point to I actually did call the file in this case, but I think it's actually color intensity. We will run the script, and you'll see the four tiles were imported once again. But in this case, 
as you can see the color intensity was changed slightly it's a because a lower contrast image there are multiple uh, filters and settings and configurations can be applied during import. Needless to say, in the context of our, our webinar, I don't have time to show them all, but consult the reference guide and you can see the other, the other uh, uh, um, changes or other um, modifications that can be applied during import. So this is just an example of, of, again, simply importing and changing those parameters. Okay, we've been looking at raster files to this point. Let's take a look at some, uh, some vector data. Um, Basically, the import process is the same. You, you know, point to a file or a directory containing the appropriate file types, and the import process will work the same. The particular example I'm going to show you here um, is actually going to one that I, um, I you know, think is very important within the context of, uh, of Global Mapper. Um, I'm going to open again this particular file, the script file. We're importing a single file in this case, our import command followed by the parameter file name and there's the path to the file. It happens to be a US states shapefile. Uh, uh, delineation of the uh, uh, outlines the boundaries of the US states and area features. Um, I've told it it is a shapefile. This in certain situations is kind of a redundant command but a redundant parameter but it's it's useful uh, kind of to keep the structure of your uh, uh, your script files consistent to include that type variable. The one thing I have added here which is useful is to define an area type. Um, in the context of Global Mapper, if we go to the configuration dialog box and we choose our area styles, those of you who have used Global Mapper will be familiar with the function that allows you to assign, in this case, area features to either, either a predefined type or a type that you create. Now the consequences of this uh, is A, as you can see I selected scrub area, it will change the visual characteristics, it will change the shading pattern and the outline if, it's, if there is one present. Um, it will also apply attributes based on whatever attribution you want to apply to this particular area type or line type or point type as the case may be. So this area styles is something that we would typically recommend you, you do before or, or during the process of importing or after importing a file. Um, if I import the same shapefile that we're going to be working with in just one second. It opens as what's called an unknown feature. It, it, Global Mapper doesn't know what these are. We would have to choose the options for that imported layer and manually assign it to whatever type we need. So that is the procedure as it is right now using the interface itself. What I've done with my script is to predefine that area type. And my area type in this case is called state. And state happens to be a bolder line with a prominent label right in the middle. You can obviously change these parameters or these the visual characteristics as you want or create your own. But I'm just using one called state right now. The result of this process should be the file will import and the visual appearance will change. The outline borders will be bolder. So let's go ahead and select the script that we just previewed and click open. And we'll run the script one more time. And as you can see, not only has it imported the file, but it has also pre-assigned it or automatically assigned it to the appropriate type. You can see it's now feature type state. You can, if you consider work, your workflow kind of understanding the capability of this function, your import process could be entirely driven by a script so you can bypass a number of the manual configuration options that need to be applied during import. Um, your .gms file could be the trigger that imports files from a defined directory if necessary. So the way, this is another method or another example of the ability to automate multiple feature, or multiple uh, commands, multiple configuration settings. So far we've been dealing just with importing and we're going to continue temporarily. I've got one more import scenario to show you and it's similar to what we had done with our, our imagery before where we defined a directory within which to import multiple files. I have the same type of script here for importing some vectors, some shapefiles in this case. 
But what you'll see in this case is rather than just pointing to that directory, this is the folder within which those uh, the multiple shape files are located. I believe in this case this is just a number of shape files for different areas of the state of Texas. Um, a shape file, I'm sure most of you are familiar, will is actually multiple files. So if I actually just browse to this folder called shape files, you'll find there's the each uh, individual shape file, shape file has an SHP, a DBF, an SH, SHX file, probably a PRJ file as well. So there are multiple files. We're only interested in the shape files, the uh, the actual geometric files with the SHP suffix. So I have applied a file name mask during import. This is another one of my parameters and my value here. Again, again I'm using quotes, but it's a wildcard, my little asterisk, and the .shp. In other words, I want just the files that end with .shp, which we know is going to be those with a .shp suffix. So I will only get the shape files. I could have multiple other file types in there. I might have some uh, some additional uh, geospatial data or some text files just for accompanying notes in this case. And the result of that, as you will see, is, I'm trying to talk at the same time as my thing, a number of files. Now it looks like a single file right now, but if we open our overlay control center, you'll see it's actually a series of files. We're going to be using this particular example a little bit later for some other scripting scenarios. So here's a situation where we took a directory with multiple files and, and imported them um, consecutively but made sure that it was just our shape files. That process, um, the ability to address multiple files simultaneously, in this case pointing to the directory, is a key component of many scripting scenarios. Uh, so we're not pointing at an individual file, but rather pointing at multiple files. And we'll build on that theme through applying different configuration settings uh, and so on and so forth. So th up to this point, um, the script files that I've been running have been entirely based on importing, um, essentially importing directly uh, uh, to within the application itself. Um, and my files have been run from the file menu. I've gone to the file menu each time and essentially initiated the script from that. We're going to change focus slightly here because um, we're going to talk about how you can run a script without even interacting with the software itself and, and that is probably what most people would consider a script to be, something you can run without actually having to manually click on a menu for instance. So I'm going to minimize Global Mapper. We're going to keep it up and running because we are going to use the software as a verification for uh, the processes that we've applied if they've actually worked. Um, but we're going to look at a couple of uh, uh, kind of more advanced applications and then Next example I'm going to show you, you'll notice I've actually got an export. Not only am I importing, but now I'm going to export. And we'll go ahead and preview that one. The same import um, steps that I had in my previous uh, script, basically importing all the shape files from this directory, is now followed by an export. I'm going to export in a different format. You'll see at the end of this line the parameter here is type is KML, Keyhole Markup Language, which is the Google Maps language. You'll also see my parameters, my, one of the parameters is my file name. File name in this case is actually the uh, path including the file name itself. Now if you recall, there are multiple files being imported because I'm pointing to this directory. I believe there are 10 files in total but I'm exporting a single file called regions. This parallels Global Mapper's normal behavior as far, far as export is concerned. When you import multiple files of a particular type, you know, raster or vector or elevation data, and you initiate an export, by default, all of those files will be combined for export pro for export processes. So, you know, generating uh, a single image file from multiple tiles uh, that you imported. That's the normal behavior of the application, and that's what's being mirrored here in this script file. I'm importing multiple files, but I'm exporting a single file, and that's going to be in a KML format. One other thing, to, by way of you know, uh, looking at what we're doing in this script, this is a common. 
procedure, common uh, workflow that scripting would be applied to, essentially converting data. Um, we're converting from shape to KML, simple as two lines of text, and that, that uh, conversion process will be initiated. So uh, as I mentioned previously, GMS files are now associated with Global Mapper. I, I did that once and Windows remembered that configuration setting. So rather than having to go to the application to pull in the script file, I'm simply going to double click on this file and through that file association um, the software will know to pull the, the, uh, the mapping engine and to run the particular processes I've defined. Oh, one thing I want to show you as well, I know we've already run the script but I want to kind of backtrack briefly here. You will notice that my export directory, webinar data output, uh, Texas, and then we have the name of the file. You'll have to take my word for it, but this folder called Texas did not exist. We had an output folder that we um, uh, had created previously. Uh, we're going to be using that for generating a lot of files. But this Texas folder was generated by the script. Because the folder wasn't there, the script knows to generate that folder. And inside that folder, if everything goes according to plan, I'll check in just a second, we should have a file called uh, regions.kml. So let me switch my windows, and lo and behold, there's my output folder, there's my Texas subfolder, and there's my regions.kml. So that script took multiple shapefiles and generated a KML. And again, I told you I was going to verify that this actually worked. We'll go ahead and drag and drop into Global Mapper to initiate the import and there is my single KML file as you can see KML reprojected in geographic coordinates by default very simple process we're going to be adding to that output directory we're going to be adding additional folders and generating additional files as we go through various various uh, scripting procedures now that idea of taking in multiple files and, and generating one file is useful for sketches, merging tiles of imagery together, for instance, merging multiple uh, con um, uh, contiguous shapefiles into one file. But it's probably more common that you'll want to address individual files in a directory, run them through a conversion process, perhaps converting them or reprojecting them. We'll get to that in just a second. And actually outputting the same number of files, in other words, keeping the geographic integrity of those files intact. And if that's your intention, this next script is going to show you how to do that. We are again looking at the same files, the same um, uh, Texas data, but you'll notice the sort of my script is significantly more uh, significantly different. The first line, the first uh, command that I've applied is a uh, loop start, a directory loop start, and I'm basically telling it to begin the process here, and you'll notice all the way at the end we have a directory loop end as well. My directory is then defined, the first parameter here, same location that we were looking at before, our shape files, which are those 10 individual shape files. Our file name mask has been applied once again, we want to limit uh, the process to just the shapefile. So to this point it looks similar to our previous script. We then define the import process based on each individual file within that directory. Now this uh, component, this parameter you see here essentially um, is the file name with the directory. That's what that abbreviation stands for. So this would be comparable to running a script where we define an individual file. Um, except in this case it's asking me to look for individual file names within this directory that we previously defined. We're still within the, the loop but we take that file that was imported and we export it and again the, the uh, path is defined to a new folder I created and the file name without extension, in other words the original file name that it's going to import is added to the export. I don't know what that is right now because there are 10 different files so this is going to be populated for me as part of the scripting process. The name of the file without its extension, we don't need the .shp obviously, but it's going to be added in here and we are going to put our own .kml extension at the end and we're going to tell it that it is a KML type as well. The other thing we need to do here after each uh, loop after each section of loop is to make sure we unload what was there previously otherwise it will start again and accumulate as it goes through each each step. 
So the long and short of it is this script will allow me to go through and address each of the 10 individual shapefiles, bring each one in individually, export each individually to a KML file, begin and begin the process with the second file, etc, etc, etc. And if all goes according to plan, and again I should have shown you the directory is called KML, so we'll go ahead and look for that directory right now. It's not going to be there, but we'll see it being created and then we'll see the results of that um, as we run the script. So right now under my output folder, I don't have a KML folder. I've just got the one I created previously, which was Texas. So let's go ahead and run that script. And while we're waiting, you'll notice now the KML folder has been created. And if we open it, you will notice it didn't take long, but we now have 10 KML files where there were previously 10 shapefiles. That scripting structure is extremely useful. In this case, I have only got 10 files. This could be 10,000 files. It could be as many files as you want all of which are individually addressed, whatever procedure or process that you want can be applied to each one individually and they then can be written out in either the original format if necessary or any format that you choose, any of the supported formats. Knowing that this capability, this functionality is available, um, I've uh, mentioned to quite a few people about the idea of, of creating a Dropbox. The folder that contained the original data that we processed in this script file could act like a Dropbox. Any shapefiles that you need to process, just throw them into that folder. Just copy them to that folder or have your colleagues put whatever data they need to process in a defined directory or folder. The script file which points to that folder can essentially automatically process each file that's in there. So you drop the data in and just run the script and the script will do all the work for you. You don't have to manually manipulate the data, you don't have to manually import it and establish configuration settings. The script has done that for you. So this is a great example of a script uh, being used for large volumes of data, potentially large volumes of data. Let's take a look at the second. We're going to move back into the raster world again. We'll go ahead and take a preview of, of uh, this particular example. We're importing a, an imagery tile. This is just one tile of imagery, a small little section and we're exporting it to a raster. We're not actually reprojecting or converting it in any way. We're just simply importing and exporting. Um, our path, uh, file name path, has been defined. Um, there is a folder defined here called tiles, which will be created. We know it's not there already, so we're exporting to tiles, and the file itself will be called Augusta. We're going to convert the name to Augusta. It's going to be a JPEG 2000 file, which is the same as the format when we import it. We're going to define the spatial resolution of the export. I believe this is much, much lower resolution than the native file. I do this simply so it speeds up the, uh, the processing. But the key part of this script is the fact that I'm defining a grid or a series of tiles so that rather than exporting a single file for this, t this image, I'm exporting three rows and three columns, grid type rows columns, three, three, and you'll see this all noted very clearly in the online reference guide. If I wanted five rows and two columns, I would simply exchange or change the three to a five and this three to a two. That's how that works. You can also define your, your uh, tiling process based on pixel dimensions or based on real world dimensions as well. But in my case, I simply want to divide the image up into equal areas, three, by three. So I'm going to have nine files total. That's the intention of this script. And the image tile is just a simple uh, little JPEG of some aerial imagery. This one takes a little bit of time to run, but it's kind of fun to watch it pr uh, proceed here. So we'll go ahead and initiate that. And we'll bring up my output folder. And my tiles folder has been created, as you can see. And you'll see each of these individual tiles now being added. I like the way that this kind of status bar runs in real time. It's not even a status bar. It's showing you the files being generated. Um, the labeling, by the way, has, was pre-configured within the application, so it used that default A1, A2, A3. That's my first row. B1, B2, B3. And the name that I had assigned is applied to all. So I started with one tile of imagery. I ended up with nine. And I'll just drop a couple of those in place here and we'll see those tiles.
and there's just two of the tiles. It started as one large square. I now have nine smaller uh, squares. So that's a script. Let me go ahead and close that one. That's a script that allowed me to apply a modification or apply a setting during export. Those of you familiar with Global Mapper, those of you who have used the export dialog box, will be very familiar with uh, one of the tabs along the top of that screen it says gridding. This is essentially what gridding is. It's the ability to divide an exported layer up into smaller areas, you know, maybe to, to create manageable file sizes. And again, the uh, parameters, you can define however many grids you want, whoever, whatever size you want. Uh, certainly that's uh, well within the ability of the script. Now this next example I'm going to show you is an extremely important one, reprojection. The structure of this script again is different than the standard that we had so seen before because one of the things you'll notice here is we begin and it, it, there are you know, flexibility in terms of the order in which these commands can be applied but I've begun my script with a definition of the projection parameters that I want to apply. The define p underscore prj um, is the opening line, the parameter, first parameter here is the projection name, this can be whatever you want, you type in whatever you want, and then you'll see the projection parameters. Uh, it's a Lambert conformal conic projection and you'll notice all of the other settings for this projection. The key one here that I modified is uh, the central meridian, in this case is uh, 100 degrees west of the prime meridian. When we're finished defining the projection parameters, we end the definition of the projection. So this is kind of a unique and very specialized scripting component where we define the projection. By the way, I didn't do this from scratch. This was actually created from a workspace file. In a few minutes before we wrap up, I'll show you how you can do the same. You can define the, the projection parameters uh, simply by uh, creating a workspace with the same par parameters manually applied and then put it in your script. But in this case, I'm going to be importing a file, the actual uh, work of the script begins right after defining the projection parameters. I, in, I start by importing. You will recognize the file that we had imported previously. It's our states shapefile. I then load the projection that was previously created. This reference is to a projection name as noted right above. So our projection is noted here. Reprojected our shape uh, U.S. states from geographic projection into uh, Lambert, Lambert conformal conic, and then we're going to export that back out to a shape file again. It is a shape file. That's the type. It's area of, uh, area features that I'm exporting, and I do want to generate a projection file as well. So those are just some of the parameters I'm applying during the export process. So again, w what we're doing here, taking a geographically projected, uh, own projected uh, shape file applying Lambert Conformal Conic and exporting that back out to shapefile again. So this is essentially a very simple reprojection tool. We'll run that one and we'll go straight to our output folder once again and wait for the file. It's under US Lambert and we have a new shapefile. And where previously we had a geographically present, uh, rep, uh, projected version or unprojected version, we now have a reprojected version of our world ma our, uh, US map. Very simple process. The logical next step, um, you know, we've, we've defined how to reproject files. We've also, in a previous scenario, defined how we can address multiple files individually. Next logical step is to combine those two, and that's what this example does. begins the same way where we define a projection. In this case, the projection I'm defining is geographic projection. Uh, the native file is, is projected to UTM. Um, I'm going to reproject to geographic in this case. So my projection definition is geographic, NAT 83, etc., etc., and making sure that I'm ending the uh, projection definition with end define proj, as you can see. We're then going to import all of the files in a directory. We're going back to what we did a few minutes ago where we're going to point to our shapefiles directory, uh, filtering just the shapefiles, the, the .shp files. We're going to import each one individually. We're going to load the previously named projection from the line above. 
and then we're going to export and again we're going to inherit the name from the uh, import process without its extension um, we could have kept the extension I guess but we're manually putting the .shp on the end and defining the parameters of our shapefile. Also we want to make sure we onload each time because we don't want an accumulated shape, uh, reprojection each time. So we onload as each cycle of the loop goes through and when it's done with all of the files our loop ends. We have that at the end. These are like bookmarks by the way when we have a uh, loop start and loop end they're like bookmarks either end of the procedure that you want to follow. The folder into which these are going to be created is called Texas TX GOG, Geographically Projected, which again is not there right now. So we'll go ahead and start that process. And Texas underscore GOG has been created. Shapefiles are that did not take long at all. And just again, we'll quickly prove that these shapefiles are what we need. This is the small region, and you'll notice bottom of my screen, this is now geographically projected as opposed to UTM, which it was in its native format. So that script, I'll just bring it up again because it is an extreme, is a script that you can use to essentially reproject as many files as you need within a defined project, uh, directory. Define the projection, the output projection that's required because these shape files um, are natively UTM. There's a PRJ file, so they import it with that projection, but we override that using the load projection command. And again, whether there are 10 or 20 or 100 or 200, all of the files will be project reprojected in that way. This is a very, very efficient batch processing tool. You could also apply this reprojection. Uh, if you had multiple data types. So your file name mask may include shape files, possibly you know, maybe some imagery as well, which was in the same native projection. You could essentially reproject all at once. And as you've seen, we can do that without actually looking at the software itself. I'll keep my clean. This is a file. So in this script, we're going to load up some imagery, another simple little imagery tile. Actually, yeah, this is a, a, a different file actually. This is a, a DRG file, which is a, a raster uh, version of the USGS quad maps, a digital raster graphic file. And it's in GeoTIFF format. I'm pointing to this pre-existing data. We are going to export this. We're going to convert it during the export to a JPEG 2000 in the folder called USGS. I, I define the name of the folder right here. It doesn't exist other than in this um, file name parameter. Before we export, before the export initiates, we are going to crop um, an area of that imagery and we're going to do it based on an existing file. The parameter here is crop polygon file and the value points in this case to a shapefile. This shapefile simply contains a circle, a very simple example. It's a circular feature that's going to be the basis for the extent of the imagery that's going to be exported. In other words, I'm importing the full file, but just exporting what's within this, the extent of this feature. Now, this is just a very simple shapefile with one feature in it. To put this in context, I'm going to open up Global Mapper and I'm going to manually load the file that we're going to be working with first. My DRG file, let's see now, and you'll see this just a raster file. We're going to be using this for another scenario in just a little bit closer here, and you can see it's a standard topographic map. So, we unload that, and we'll run that. And in our output directory, we have a new folder called USGS. And I call this particular little subset interchange for reasons which hopefully will be obvious in just a second because when we import it I simply have a small little area encompassing one section which is a highway interchange. The extent of this file would have been defined by a circular feature that was in shapefile format that I had previously created and pointed to in that script file. So cropping can be applied you can apply cropping to imagery or to multiple uh, many other data sets uh, using a script. 
This is another uh, slight variation on cropping, and what I want to show you, um, it's actually a tool that can be applied within the software itself, but as a script, the benefit of, a, of its applicability as a script means it can be applied to simultaneously to multiple files. And those of you familiar with Global Mapper and familiar with some of the cropping tools will, will already be familiar with the ability that Global Mapper has to remove the color from a, ma um, a topographic map. Essentially everything outside of the neat line can be automatically cropped away. And that's exactly what this line is doing, this parameter and this value are doing. It's automatically clipping the color. We previewed the uh, USGS map a few minutes ago, and you're, if you remember, it did have a lot of information around the neat line. If you're trying to import and work with abutting maps of that type, you're going to have overlap. That neat line information is going to overlap uh, the adjacent map. So this is a method for removing that, automatically removing that color. I'm going to run this script very quickly, and we will see the results under DRG in this case. In this case it's a JPEG 2000 and you'll see it's... Oops, I'm sorry, it, was quite, it wasn't quite ready, I was a little too impatient. Let's try that one more time. It's quite a big file so it's 18 meg. One more time. And there we go. So the itself has been cropped down, or the map itself has done to the extent of the useful information, the map itself, all of the uh, information on its side, the neat line is gone. Now again, that using that in combination with our um, um, looping, our direct reloop function, you can then apply the same cropping to multiple files simultaneously. So to this point, we've used some raster files. We've used some vector files, done some conversion, reprojection of, uh, of some of our vector files. I'm going to change focus slightly here for the last uh, few uh, examples of our scripts. We're going to work with some elevation data. And as you'll see on the screen, the next script I'm going to run is called Create Elevation Grid. The source data in this case is some LiDAR data. Um, my initial import is pointing to a .laz file. A .laz file is a compressed LiDAR file. LAS would be the LiDAR data in its original format. LAZ is the compressed version. Uh, those of you not familiar with LiDAR, essentially LiDAR is a series of points and those points contain elevation and a number of other pieces of information as well um, but it's very often used as the basis for creating a terrain surface or creating a, an elevation surface that's what I'm going to do in this scenario. I'm going to run that process generating a terrain surface and that's the second command that I have in my script generate elevation grid and I'm going to have the elevation units be meters in this case. To see the results of the process I'm going to then export and it's going to be exported in a proprietary format, a global mapper proprietary format called GMG, Global Mapper Grid Format. And my elevation units for exporting are going to be centimeters. So the end result of this is I'm going to have a terrain surface that I can load into. In this case, it's a proprietary format for use in Global Mapper, but I could uh, you know, export it into a .dem or any of the other supported elevation formats. Let's find my script once again, sorry, there we go. So create an elevation grid. Simply double click once again. I f once again forgot to make a mental note of what the directory was. Hopefully it'll be fairly intuitive. And uh, it's called LiDAR, that's right. So we started with LiDAR data, point data, created a grid, an elevation grid, and then we exported, and this is the result. And unfortunately, I didn't have time to show you the original data, but now we have a terrain surface. Uh, this began as a series of, of points with embedded elevations and, and various other pieces of information. So generating a terrain surface from, from, in this case, from LiDAR data. Very simple procedure with a script. The next example takes the same principle, but applies an, an additional set of, uh, set of commands and parameters. As you'll see, the first couple of lines are exactly the same where we're importing our file, generating our grid. In this case, we're going to go a step further and we're actually going to generate contours. You need an elevation surface, such as we created in step one, or step two, I'm sorry, um, to create contours. So by generating contours, 
uh, or by building uh, creating an elevation grid, we can then generate our contours. My contour interval is going to be one, in this case, units are meters. And I'm going to export those contours. Those contours are linear features in vector format, and we're going to export those as a shape file. So this four line script takes LiDAR data and generates contours. That's ultimately what we're doing here. And I've defined some of the parameters for my contours as well. And we'll just go ahead and run that one, and the folder that will be created is called contours. So. This one takes a little bit longer because, again, there's multiple processes, the initial import, then the gridding, then the creation of, uh, of my contours, and then the export of those contours. But it should be along just a second. The contours folder should be up here in any minute now. There we go. And there's my shape file. And as you can see, we generated some contours. Point data went through being a raster layer, and now it's a series of contours. And we can is the 3D line features. Pulling them up, I might and see that they actually have a Z value associated with them. Couple more. There is a tool in Global Mapper for generating watersheds. Um, those of you who have sat them with my previous webinars may have seen me do that within the context of the software itself using the various dialog boxes and menus. But we can also define a number of the watershed functions right here in the scripting tool. And in this case I'm running a, going to be running a very specific watershed analysis. What I'm going to do after importing an elevation surface, I, I'm not creating the surface, this is a pre-created elevation model by the way, this is a .dem file that I'm pointing to, um, but after that file has been imported, I'm going to use my generate watershed command. Uh, those of you who are familiar with watersheds will be uh, familiar with some of these uh, uh, parameters. The stream threshold parameter determining the extent of the catchment area of the, of the watershed itself. Um, the maximum depth defining the depression depth that will be filled to allow continuing flow. And then in this case I'm creating a watershed that defines the flow to a defined position. Uh, this is an X and Y value, I believe it's uh, state plane coordinates in the same projection as my original file, these X and Y values. So I'm essentially delineating uh, the catchment area that, that would determine the drainage to a defined point in this case. Um, I don't want to generate areas for my entire watershed boundaries, I just want to delineate this area. You'll see the results of that in a minute. When I'm done with that process, it's going to have two vector files or two vector types. One is lines, which is my drainage network, and the other is an area feature that encompasses the flow or the watershed that flows to this, this particular point. I'm exporting both of those, but because a shapefile will only support one data type, lines or points or polygons, um, I'm doing that twice. First time I'm exporting my areas, second time I'm exporting my lines. And we should end up with two files in the folder called Watershed. Again, you'll see the circle spinning around, indicating it's it's working. We'll jump to our output folder, and there's my watershed. Now that imported, ran the process, and then exported, and I have a couple of shape files here. Actually, before I import, I'm going to load up the original elevation model manually. This is cheating a little bit, but I just want to put it in a visual context when we get nice drainage lines that were generated based on the shed modeling process. Those hypothetical channels and the area that I created is now, as you see, delineated. The, the, the point of reference was right in this uh, channel right here. So this is a catchment area defining what flows to that point. So that entire procedure, although we ended up bringing in the application for uh, just to give it some uh, visual context, could have been done without even looking at the uh, application itself. Let me unload. Now the final script I'm going to show you is actually my personal favorite. Um, and even those of you who are reasonably familiar with Global Mapper may not be aware of the fact that this tool is available within the software itself. 
Um, create equal value from selected areas is the name of the tool in the software and this is the, the scripting version of that. And what it allows you to do, um, depending on the type of data you're working with, is either extract um, either color features defined by a certain threshold, specific elevation ranges, or specific slope ranges from a loaded raster layer and it will create a, an area feature encompassing all of those uh, areas that match your, your uh, requirements. Um, in other words, if you want to extract all of the, the red colored features from a map, you can run this process, identify the RGB value for that, those red features, maybe give yourself a little bit of a threshold, plus or minus, and it will capture those and delineate those as vector area features. What I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to run a, an equal uh, area value analysis, not based on uh, colors, but based on slopes. I want to define, I want to delineate and have a visual record of where the, uh, s the steepest slopes and the most gentle slopes are within an area. Um, we can define that visually in the software by applying a specific shader, in this case my slope shader. So what I'm going to do first, my first line of my script is importing my file. It's a the Gardner elevation model as we've used before. Um, it's a USGSDEM, and then I'm applying that slope shader, and that's required for the, the, the step that I'm going to perform right afterwards, which is essentially uh, extracting those slope variables. The second uh, command in my script is to generate the equal uh, value areas. I'm pointing to the same file again. Um, the layer description that I'm going to generate is going to be called slopes. Um, the slope distance is 3 in this case. Now this is a threshold value that I've established that allows me to capture not just every whole number slope value but establish a threshold. So a, a plus and minus 3 value which is, is what's been applied here. I will have a, a areas from 0 to 6, 6 to 12, 12 to 18. Again plus and minus 3 each time. That's why that's a range of 6. And I'm also going to generate an attribute in each of these area features called slope that will have the slope variable attached to it. This again is generating vector, so I'm going to export that vector to a shapefile with all of the parameters that we've used before. So hopefully you follow that. At the end result, hopefully I'll make it a little clearer as well. Um, running that script, you can see it thinking. Final folder we're going to be looking at is called slopes and we generated a shapefile. And this shapefile, when I import it, now this shapefile had the uh, visual characteristics attached to it, so that's why it's pre-colored like this. Global Map was able to, able to interpret those. But this was a raster elevation. We zoom in close here. Let me just use my, my zoom tool to go a little closer. You'll notice the pixelation here because of the native resolution of the data, the 10 meter resolution. But you'll see now that each of these area features that I've selected has a defined slope value as you can see. So the darker colors in this case would be areas with steeper slopes, the lighter colors more gentle slopes, minimum and maximum 0 to 6 as you can see my slope threshold being 3. So that's just another example of using a script to perform an analysis function in this case pulling those slope values out combining that with my uh, um, directory looping process you can perform the same function on multiple files simultaneously generating these area features exporting them to shapefile. So there's one more workflow that I want to show you before we wrap up and I promised you this right at the start when we were looking at uh, my introductory screen. We're going to begin this by actually looking at the software itself and I'm going to load up a file. It's actually a file that we've used couple of times today. It's my US states layer. And it comes in, it's geographically projected or on projected, I should say, I keep forgetting, geographically projected. Um, I want to reproject this layer. I go to my configuration, I choose the projection tab, and I'm going to do what we had done previously, which is Lambert conformal conic. I'm going to define the parameters for this projection. My central meridian in this case is not going to be zero. I'm going to make it 100 degrees west of the prime meridian, otherwise it'll be kind of strangely distorted. So we'll click OK and what we should see is what we saw earlier when we reprojected it using the script. The visual 
characteristics will change and it's now a conic projected map. So at this stage what I want to do is save a workspace. Now for those of you who are not familiar with Global Mapper, a workspace is a file that lets you essentially save the configuration that you've applied to your map. You know, the layers that you've imported, the features you've created, uh, perhaps the reprojection parameters you've applied. Um, I'm going to take this, I'm going to put it right in my output folder as before, I'm going to call this workspace states. Now this workspace as you'll see has a .gmw suffix, it's a global mapper workspace. And I can load up a workspace, it will, um, you know, let's say I go home for the day, come back in tomorrow, continue on this project, it will load up this US states map just exactly like you're seeing it right now. However, if we take a look at that file, I have to go up one level, there we go, and once, as we did with our script files, if we open in notepad, it is an ASCII file, you'll find the first line on my workspace, this is not a script, this is a .gmw, says global mapper script. There's a number of um, commands and parameters which are redundant here, you know, file name, background color, the need to unload all, a lot of these are redundant and can be removed as necessary. You can delete them. But basically what you have here is a script file that defines the path to the file I imported, some of the parameters of that, again a lot of these are fairly redundant, but this is the key one right here. Define projection all the way to end projection. What you see highlighted can form the basis of a script that you use to reproject your own data. Again, a lot of the other information here doesn't really have any relevance, so you could remove it. The map layout definition you really don't need for simple data processing. But using this as a basis, um, your global mapper workspace, which many of you will have created many, uh, many times using uh, the software, can now be used as the basis for a script. A global mapper script and a global mapper workspace are essentially one and the same thing. So, between uh, using the online reference guide, using your existing workspaces, and perhaps even using some of these examples which I'm going to share with you when I post these onto our website, you should be able to generate your own script, scripts very quickly and easily. So my final slide, to script or not to script? It is a question that is worth asking. Um, we often get people saying, well, you know, why should I even use the software now? A script will do everything for me. Uh, in the realm of GIS, as you'll see in this, uh, in this paragraph, GIS is a visual tool. You will never get away from that. Uh, you cannot completely replicate the process of working with data uh, in Global Mapper by scripting. You often need to see the data, you need to interact with the data, you need to make your choices on how that data is configured based on what you see. Scripting is ideally suited for those data processing tasks, large volumes of data, um, you know, routine procedures that you can automate, that's where scripting comes into its own and is a very, very useful tool. Thank you for taking today to attend our webinar. Um, the scripting reference I showed you previously can be accessed directly from our Blue Marble Geo website. I always like to put a plug in for the, the forum. If you haven't already registered with the forum, uh, go ahead and visit globalmapperforum.com and you'll find a lot of postings in there related to scripting. Uh, in fact, the continuing evolution of our scripting functionality and the additional commands and parameters that have been added are very often initiated by discussions in the forum. So be a participant in the development of Global Mapper. Got a few emails here, the email addresses that you can use to contact us for support. If you want to uh, order some of our software or you're interested in some training, you'll see those uh, addresses on here. And finally, if you're not currently using the software, uh, there's a link at the bottom, there's a, a, the URL that you can go and you can download it and you can try it for two weeks. As I said at the start of my presentation, the, this will be uh, recorded and it will be published on our website. Um, if you're looking at the recording right now, right now you should see uh, a link uh, somewhere around the web page that will give you access to the data that I use today, uh, in the scripts themselves as well as the accompanying data, so you should be able to run those directly. So, Thank you once again and we look forward to speaking with you next time.